Welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. Um, my guest today is Rod Dreher, and uh, you may know him from all of his uh, previous writings, um, whether that's at the American Conservative or elsewhere, and by, from his previous book, The Benedict Option. But what we're going to talk about today is Live Not By Lies, which is his latest book, and I think is it's a really fascinating and important book for our moment because um, it not only talks about uh, the comparisons between totalitarian societies and what he calls our pre-totalitarian society, um, but also talks about how people and talks to people um, who lived under totalitarian societies, mostly communist societies, and uh, how they managed to resist is too broad a word because it covers so many different actions. Um, but what I want to say is that the second half of this book is very much dedicated to how to live um, in a totalitarian society with a, a certain amount of truth and conscience and um, dignity. So uh, welcome, Rod Durr. And it's Durr, it's really great to have you here on High Noon. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, so the first question I really wanted to ask you um, is why you decided to write this particular book. Um, was it somebody that you talked to that um, gave you sort of their perspective being from a totalitarian society or from a communist society? Um, what, at what point did it flip over, I guess is my question, mm -hmm. where you started thinking, hmm, there's a lot of these people who are saying or raising alarm bells about how life in America is uh, in, in our, our time? Well, it started with the phone call back in either 2014, 2015. I can't remember precisely. I think it was 15. It came to me from a doctor at the Mayo Clinic. We had a mutual friend and he had told our mutual friend that he needed to tell some journalists what had just happened. So guy gave him my number. What the uh, doctor said was that his elderly mother who lives with him and his wife had grown up in Czechoslovakia and uh, as a, she was a young woman when communism came there, the communist government told her to stop going to church. She says, I'm not gonna stop going to church. So they arrested her for being a quote, Vatican spy. They put her in prison for four years and tortured her. When she got out, she immigrated to America and got married and that was the rest of her life. The mom was telling her son, son, the things I see happening in America now remind me of what it was like in my home country when communism first came to power. What she was talking about was uh, cancel culture, the emergence of cancel culture, the emergence of wokeness, people being afraid to say what they, what they really think and so forth. And uh, it really rattled this doctor. And I thought, wow, that's that's really something. But, you know, my mom is old. She watches a lot of cable news. She gets scared about everything. Maybe this old woman is overreacting. So I made a point whenever I would travel around for conferences, things like that, if I would run into somebody who lived in America today but had come from the Soviet bloc, I would just ask them, are the things you're seeing happening in our country today reminiscent of what you left behind? And as every single one of these people, without fail, said yes. And if you talk to them long enough, they would be so angry over the fact that Americans just didn't take them seriously. So after this happened enough times, I finally said, you know, there's a book here. You know, uh, this, this sounds like very familiar to me just personally, because my parents come from uh, communist Poland. But uh the, the the sort of um, warning that it, that is gone, I wouldn't even say unheard, but is in some way can't be heard, right? Like that that um, there is a certain kind of baseline assumption about being an American, um, and of course, in many other societies, there was a similar assumption. Uh, but I think especially about being an American, that mm -hmm. this really can't happen here. Um, yeah. We we have a particular history, which has its own black marks, but that we don't have the kind of history that, uh, say, you know, pre-revolutionary Russia had or, or um, other places where these kinds of totalitarian societies rise. Um, and there's this just very strong mental block um, in terms of even considering the kind of possibility um, do you do you think that that mental block is starting to break down in the face of some of the things we've seen over the past, whether that's year, two years, or, or um, you know, even going back a few years? Yeah, I think it is starting to break down, but it's still going slowly. 
This book, Live Not By Lies, has sold, as we're talking, almost 150,000 copies in the 14 months it's been out, which is uh, really extraordinary for a book like this. But it has sold those copies in the face of zero attention from the mainstream media. You know, And I can understand why they wouldn't pay attention to this book, because the book damns them as being part of the soft totalitarian regime. Uh, but I, what I'm finding, though, is that people are talking among themselves, especially in church groups. Uh, whenever I go out, travel, and talk about the book, people will come up to me and say, I bought five copies for people in my church because we have to figure this out. And so word of mouth is uh, sort of like Sam's dot is becoming the way that the awareness is spreading. But you know, you're very right about Americans just not wanting to see what's happening right in front of our eyes. Solzhenitsyn saw this himself after he came to the West, after the Soviets expelled him in the, uh, I believe it was a 1983 edition of the Gulag Archipelago, he said this directly. He said that uh, everybody around the world looks at what happened to the Soviet Union and say, well, what happened there could never happen here. It wouldn't be that way with us. In fact, said Solzhenitsyn, what happened in my country could happen in any country on earth under the right set of circumstances. As I argue and live not by lies, Hannah Arendt, her uh, her list of factors that that lead to totalitarianism they're all present here, just as they were present in pre-revolutionary Russia and in pre-Nazi Germany. Um, you know, one of the things that really runs through this book is is the promise of utopia on Earth, right? Um, and and that particularly promise delivered or promise or or sort of disseminated in a society in which people have totally broken faith with institutions and with any kind of sort of community organizations. Um, you know, I guess what I kept thinking about when I was reading it or listening to it rather was, um, you know, a conflict of visions and in terms of, of the constrained versus unconstrained view uh, that that promising um, different kinds of utopia, right, depending on um, the circumstances of, of the society that it was being sold into. Um, but, but you really focus on what the conditions are of the people receiving that message, I think rightly because there's always somebody promising mm -hmm. um, something akin to heaven on earth. Uh, and, and usually if, if society is, is sort of good enough, um, if there are enough sources of meaning and happiness and stability and, um, you know, connection in people's lives, um, they're not particularly interested, uh, or at least not beyond a small percentage of people, um, they're not particularly interested in, in visions of utopia that may or may not come to pass. Uh, but what are some of the conditions that uh, you think are, are present that you observe or some of the similarities that you observe between, for example, pre-revolutionary Russia and United States now um, that, that make us more, more susceptible to, uh, to messages of utopia? Yeah. Well, Hannah Arendt said in her 1951 book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, that by far the most important factor in the rise of totalitarianism was mass loneliness and atomization. Uh, when people have been alienated from each other, from their communities, from their religion, from any of the things that gave people a sense of purpose, of identity and direction, then they're very vulnerable to someone coming in with a, a utopian message that tells them just trust me, trust the system, we can get this right, we can return everything that, that you've lost. This is what the Bolsheviks did and this is what the Nazis did. And we see this everywhere in America now. One of the things that really shocked me when I was doing my research was to find uh, in a 2020 survey, I think it was, that the loneliest generation in America are not the elderly, which you would expect, but rather Generation Z. Seven in 10 members of Generation Z told the pollster that they don't have any friends and they're lonely or they don't have good friends. I mean, that I find that completely extraordinary because especially happening as it is in a time when social media and social networking has supposedly connected us more closely than ever. In fact, people feel directionless and lonely. And this, I think, accounts for a lot of the, the pull of wokeness. You know, Czesław Miłosz, the great Polish um, uh, poet and dissident, said that uh, people in his book, The Captive Mind, which came out in the 50s, not long after he defected, 
He said that people in the West think that communism only has power because it scares people, because it forces itself on people, which is certainly true. It does do that. He said that people in the West, though, miss the fact that communism gives people a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose. It was a lie, said Miwons. That's why he came to the West. Nevertheless, when people don't have that sense of purpose, they don't have that sense of solidarity, then they become vulnerable to this sort of thing. And that, I think, is the main reason that wokeness, soft totalitarianism, call it what you will, is progressing in America. A second reason, and you alluded to this earlier, is a collapse in trust in institutions. Uh, if you look at the polls for a long time, Americans, uh, fewer than half of Americans say they trust most of the major institutions in society. The only ones that have polled above 50% in recent years are the police, the military, and weirdly enough, small business. Well, now with the military uh, going full on woke, I, I, I saw some polling results recently that said that trust in the military is starting to collapse. So all of this is part of, a, um, of an ongoing process that is resembles to me the proverbial frog in the boiling water. We're losing our liberty and our uh, without even being aware of what's happening. I should say, finally, one of the main factors is uh, transgression for the sake of transgression. That is to say, people want to rebel against settled norms and institutions just for the sake of seeing what happens. I mean, this is common everywhere. It's even been commodified since the 1960s rebellion. But now we are seeing the, the fruits of that in a disconnection from any authoritative institutions. You know, you remind us in this uh, that similarly following World War I, there was this sort of cross-national period of, depending on your perspective, sexual liberation or sexual decadence, right, um, that, that actually, you know, preceded some of these communist revolutions, um, but but also in countries that didn't end up having communist revolutions. After World War I, there was a sort of great disillusionment um, with institutions. Uh, but, but you do point to like the fact that this has happened before. We tend to think of our loose social mores as something new and revolutionary. Uh, but in fact, you point here, point to here that, that that this isn't this. You call it transgression for the sake of transgression. That this this search for, um, you know, sort of uh, something. Uh, I'm, I'm, let me think about what I want to say here. Um, I, I guess I'm thinking about the art um, of interwar <clears throat> Germany, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where, of course, Hitler famously called it degenerate. That's not that's not what I'm going to do. Um, yeah. But but th there there is this period in art where people uh, very clearly want to show that they have no respect for the things that traditionally a mm -hmm. society respects about itself. Right. So <clears throat> you have like Otto Dix painting um, World War One veterans. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, World War One veterans in a way that's like grotesque. Right. Mm -hmm. Um or you have, you know, various, um, especially German, but like other other artists of the period as well, painting things that are not just, you know, um, revealing or, or, you know, showing nudes, which is obviously a tradition in art, but like very intentionally trying to make uh, nudes either grotesque or, um, you know, to, to give them a, a very sort of um, sexual character mm -hmm. that was different mm -hmm. than artists in the past. And I, I wonder if what you think the connection between those two things is this sort of great disillusionment and then the the sort of hedonistic um but but it, it doesn't seem simply a search for pleasure you know you know what i'm saying right it right right like it's not a physical edge underneath it that's that's more than the simple oh this is pleasurable and i'm going to seek it because i don't have a reason not to yeah. No, you're right about that. Um, one of the things that surprised me about my historical research is to find that the Bolsheviks were sexual revolutionaries too, at least the early Bolsheviks were, the, the ones in the revolutionary generation, because they identified traditional marriage and traditional sexual roles with oppression. And they thought that if we can just get rid of these things, then we will all live in this uh, sexual utopia. And this didn't start with the 1960s. And of course, it didn't work out at, at all. But that the there was a connection between that uh, the the sexual uh, rebellion going on in the pre-revolutionary culture 
and totalitarianism. The um, I, James Billington, the former librarian of Congress, wrote this great history, a famous history of Russia called The Icon and the Axe. And in it, he talks about how the sexual decadence was endemic to elite culture in Russia in the early first century, first decade of the 20th century. And not only that, but um, not worship of Satan, but at, at least admiration of Satan. The uh, cultural elites looked to Satan, the figure of Satan, as a literary romantic hero because they admired his assertion of total will. And uh, I, I thought about this uh, earlier this year when that uh, video Montero by Lil Nas X came out, which is full of satanic imagery. Uh, this is exactly the sort of thing that you were seeing happen in pre-revolutionary Russia. And whether you believe in the devil or not is beside the point. The point is they looked at, to the figure of Satan, the ultimate rebel, the, the person who, who rebels against all authority. They looked to him as, uh, as a hero. And I, I think that this is also part of the decadence that led to the Weimar Republic and all the famous decadence of Berlin and ultimately to a fascist backlash. And I, I think that this is one, it's a sign of the times for sure, uh, when you have this sort of sexual decadence that uh, plays out in the collapse of families and the inability of people to form solid partnerships. Of course, today we have pornography endemic everywhere. And this is also making it harder for men and women to form stable relationships and it increases loneliness. So the, the, it's all tied together. You can't point to one thing and say, that is the cause. It's all working together, this disintegration of, of a formal society. I should recommend to your reader, uh, to your listeners, uh, a great book uh, called The Rites of Spring by Modris Eckstein's, E-K-S-T-E-I-N-S. -E He's a contemporary historian who looked at Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, which premiered in Paris in uh, 1913, just before the war and caused this huge uproar. But um, Eckstein says that the artists really are prophets, that what, what uh, Stravinsky anticipated and other artists too was the fundamental um, breakdown of settled cultural norms that were happening even before World War I. And of course, here comes World War I and it blows everything apart. And then we, we, we're on our way into the 20th century, a century of totalitarianism. The point is though, that if you look to the art of the pre-revolutionary period, you can see clues as to what's coming. Um, well, obviously, despite some similarities and actually one of the the big ones that I kept thinking about, um, Helen Andrews wrote a great essay uh, comparing pre-revolutionary Russia to modern America. Um, and, and one of the things she focuses on is the fact that no nobody in a position of authority or institutional power will defend the regime, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that in fact, the, the very elites sort of who, who have power in our society are exactly the people who will not defend um, the current regime, even with its own, own all of its flaws. Um, but, you know, we're not in pre-revolutionary Russia. Uh, there are obviously major differences between uh, the two situations. Um, what, what are the unique features of what is developing in America, perhaps absent um, some kind of, of pushback or change of course? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are the features that are different about our potential totalitarianism here? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that because this is one of the, the the common objections I get to my thesis. They say like, well, look around you. We don't have any gulags here. We don't have any secret police. Where are the bread lines? This can't be totalitarianism. In fact, this is a very different form of it, but it's still a, a softer form of totalitarianism. One of the, the big differences is that uh, in classic political theory, totalitarian theory, all power is concentrated in the state. We don't have that now. But what we do have is what I like to call a regime, which includes the state, but also includes the major media, the universities, the professions, the military, sports, entertainment, which is to say all the culture forming institutions in our society, they've all gone woke. They have all adopted to some degree or another, this, uh, this radical ideology that, and they have made it to where you can't get into those institutions and flourish if you object to this ideology. Now, this is at the heart, I think, of what totalitarianism is. It's not simply the government having 
total control over everything that happens, but it's rather a society that uh, will only allow one ideology to exist and that forces this ideology into every aspect of life. I think about back in 1924, the Soviet chess society got fed up with the government, the new revolutionary government, trying to force its ideology onto chess. They came out with a statement saying, we have to defend chess for chess's sake. They got a letter from a commissar that said, oh, no, no, no. In the time of the revolution, everything must be for the revolution, even chess. Well, compare that to what we're dealing with now, where uh, it seems like our woke capitalist overlords can't find enough things that they have to brand with uh, trans rights or you know, LGBT rights. Uh, you even have uh, cereal this past summer, breakfast cereal for children that had on the side of the cereal box uh, a chart telling them to pick their own pronouns. It seems like a minor thing, but this is what totalitarianism is when you can't escape the ideology, even sitting down with your children for breakfast. This is something that people don't see, though, because they're, if they're so busy looking for George Orwell's 1984 to come about, they're going to miss the fact that we're actually living in something more like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Brave New World is an important book to pay attention to because... Unlike Orwell, whose 1984 uh, had a totalitarianism that forced itself on people through fear and pain and terror, in Huxley's version, people were invited to surrender their liberties to the, uh, the totalitarian state because it gave them pleasure, it gave them material security, and it gave them constant entertainment. You didn't have to be forced to accept this. You wanted to be part of it so you could get so you could be um, part of the, the pleasure dome, live under the pleasure dome. Uh, when I think about turning points uh, in our recent history with regard to what you're calling woke capitalism um, and cancel culture, I, I pinpoint for the latter, I think um, I, I'm a Californian and uh, when, when Prop, Prop 8 was uh, going through the California political process, right? So this was the amendment uh, that was was limiting marriage to a man and a woman um, as a matter of state law. Um, I and I, I was I was against that proposition at the time, and but I I remember the first sort of instances um, of of uh, people who had donated, for example, uh, to Proposition Eight. Uh, Brandon, uh, Brandon, Brandon I, Ike, yeah. I think, yeah, was yeah. named the CEO of Mozilla, who was forced out of his company. Uh, because of a donation, a private donation that he had made to that campaign, um, there were sort of similar tactics of mobbing people um, mm -hmm. who had made donations. That's the first time I remember seeing something like that play out in politics as opposed to the campus. And then, but you you point to a different kind of turning point, I think, or at least suggest it in this book uh, with regard to companies. Um, so that was that was the turning point, I think, mm -hmm. internally, where a company was like, okay, we can't have a CEO who has donated to something that at that time, even in California, passed in a majority of, of voters. Um, but you point to this RIFRA battle in Indiana right. as the first time that you observed corporate America coming in heavily on on the side of, of sort of social liberalism. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just rehash what happened there and why it was important? Yeah, it's hugely important. Uh, you know, usually uh, we who are older, I'm 54, I grew up in a country where big business tried to stay out of politics because it was bad for business. Or that was the theory. So fast forward to 2014 or 2014 or 2015, the, the RIFRA battle in or Religious Freedom Restoration Act battle in the state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. State of Indiana, which had a Republican legislature and a Republican governor, Mike Pence at the time, they passed a state version of the Federal um, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which would have had the effect of giving religious people who were sued for discrimination a, an affirmative defense in court. It wouldn't guarantee that they would win, but it would give them a little um, uh, something to stand on affirmatively. The uh, uh, federal version passed bipartisan with bipartisan support in 1993, and various states have passed state versions too over the years. State of Indiana passed this and didn't expect any trouble with it. It's a Midwestern state, a Republican state, 
what happened was so many major corporations, Salesforce, Apple Computer, Eli Lilly, and so many others came down like a ton of bricks on the state of Indiana and said, this is bigoted legislation. And if you don't get rid of it, there will be serious economic consequences to pay. The state backed down, repealed the legislation. And that was the last time that this was tried anywhere else. It was a landmark uh, uh decision. Uh, this was the Waterloo for social and religious conservatives, because it showed that in the end, when big business takes a side in our free market uh, country, that that's the real power. And uh, I, I think that that was also the, the true beginning of woke capitalism as we know it today. And now just try to get hired by one of these companies. If you have any profile online where they can find out that you support any kind of social conservative cause, I mean, it's it's going to be really, really difficult. But that that's where it started right then. And in fact, the, the, the woman I told you about earlier, the the elderly Czech woman, she saw on the news the mobbing of Memories Pizza, that little tiny evangelical owned uh, pizza parlor in small town, Northwest Indiana. She saw how the flash mob came on, uh, came against these people and threatened to burn the thing down after they were asked on by a TV news person, would you serve gay people? And they said, of course. She said, well, would you cater a gay wedding? They said, well, no, we're evangelical Christians. That would be against our faith. There was a national mob calling on calling for the burning down of memories pizza that's the thing specifically that triggered the elderly czech woman she said this is exactly what they did in czechoslovakia to anyone who objected to the communist government right um and, and i've repeated this on on the show before but you you really and and in fact even in the soviet union and in other places um where that were unquestionably totalitarian you know the gulags were you know, other than in the thirties and, and um, under Stalin, but later the gulags were, were in existence, but they weren't the primary method of controlling people. You really had to be recal recalcitrant to end up in the gulag. You, mm -hmm. you know, it's much easier just to make people unable to, for example, if you're a doctor, make you unable to practice medicine and, and to have the only job you can find be washing dishes. And mm -hmm. uh, if, if even that, uh, or if you're an artist to prevent you from working as an artist, because you don't have your guild card um, in order to get that card, you need to be in good standing with the party, right? Um, these things start to sound much more similar to what is developing in a private context uh, in, in America. Um, but let me let me ask you uh are you are you more optimistic uh given like i guess I, I, how do incidents like i'm thinking um over voting laws in georgia where um where there was this pushback cuz delta tried to come in and do the same thing right they have a mm -hmm. huge hub in atlanta um and they tried to apply pressure to the Georgia legislature over some of the, the voting laws that they were passing. Um, and the Georgia legislature quickly voted to repeal m big tax credits that had mm -hmm. been given to Delta to reside there. I mean, do you think that um, there are more politicians on the right who are cognizant of this dynamic and understand that uh, if, if they buckle to this kind of um, corporate pressure that there's very little they will be quote unquote allowed to do in their sphere of politics? Yeah, I, I think that the, the there is an awakening going on. It needs to happen a lot faster, though. But I am glad that some people are starting to awaken. I think about J.D. Vance, who's running for Senate for the Republican nomination in Ohio. He's been very much red-pilled on the threat that corporate America faces to traditional values and to conservative liber or the liberties of conservative people, of dissidents, and, and frankly, of all of us. I think that what has to happen, though, is the re whole Republican Party has to get red-pilled on its, uh, its uh, slavish uh, uh, obedience to whatever big business wants, and I should say whatever the military wants. This has been a big problem for us. I one of uh, some guy who comments on my blog, a, a military veteran, uh, called out the other day, uh, former Republican chairs of the Armed Services Committee and the Senate saying so much of the wokeness that has come into the military came in under their watch.
because they're so afraid of leading Republican politicians to stand up to the military, to what the Pentagon wants. So I think this has to be a big and a very steep learning curve for Republican politicians about who big business and the Pentagon, are, whose side they're really on. I, I think also that the 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 capitalism aspect of this, and as uh, you can see it happen with uh, with Ryan T. Anderson, uh, pro probably a friend of yours, certainly a friend of mine in Washington, one of the top Catholic public intellectuals of his generation and a very a gentle, kind man, respectful man. He wrote this book called When Harry Met Sally, or when, no, When Harry Became Sally, sorry, um, about the transgender moment. And he was writing in criticism of it. But uh, Ryan Anderson being the kind of man he is, it was a very respectful, logical argument. The book sold fairly well, I think. But um, earlier this year, he found out by mistake that Amazon had stopped selling it. And when questioned, Amazon said, well, we're not going to sell any books that frame transgenderism as a mental illness. Now, leaving aside whether that's really what Ryan did, this was their policy. Well, guess what? We live in a free market society. They have the right to decide what books they will and won't sell. I think that right is an important right to defend. But because Amazon has a near monopoly position on, um, on the retail book market in America, if it decides that it is not going to sell a certain kind of book, a book that takes a certain political or social position, then those books won't be published because a publisher cannot take the risk of publishing, investing in a book that Amazon won't sell. So you have right here in a liberal democracy, in a free market, decisions, legal decisions made by, uh, by major economic actors that have a tremendous impact on the kind of discussion we can have in the public square. This is something that so many Americans are slow to, to grasp because so many of us, people my age and older, were raised and, and formed politically in a time in which big business was, if not on our side, at least neutral and something to be defended against the government. Times really have changed. Well, if times have changed, let's let's shift and let's think like dissidents, uh, for, for lack of a, a better word. Um, you know... One of the most difficult questions that you tackle here uh, is the line between living with lies uh, and letting them sort of come through you into the world, right? In the famous formulation, um, and and you distinguish that from you know imprudence, for example. Uh, but but on the other hand, you seem hyper aware of of the way that psychologically um these these kind of prudent decision making about when and where to speak up um how that can turn into rationalization mm -hmm. that then makes you part of um a, a a immoral system i mean what what is the line for example to make to make this practical what is the line for somebody who works in corporate america um with all of the attendant sort of woke capitalism uh stuff that we've been talking about um what is the line where they they should be willing to lose their job because there are so many people in that position right now they're wondering what to say or what to do um, or if they should speak up in environments whether that's corporate america or academia or there, there are certain places where it's easier just by virtue of, of uh, you know employment contracts and stuff but let's say corporate america which has at will employment and which has has shown itself perfectly willing not just to fire you but to sort of blackball you from your profession Yep. Yep. Well, this is an impossible question to answer with any clarity because, uh, well, I'll put it to you like this. When I was in Poland doing interviews for the book, I spoke to two different men, Polish Catholics, who told me, they asked me, what should they do? They work, both of them work for the Polish uh, uh, branch of American multinationals, and they were being forced to celebrate Pride Week, Pride Month, whatever it is. Uh, now, they said that we don't, they both told me, said, we don't have any problem working with gay people. We have gay people in our office. We get along with them fine, but we're Catholics and we feel that the company is pushing us too far here. Should we quit our jobs? Now, I'm an American who writes for a conservative magazine. I'm not going to get fired. I can go back to my comfortable home and continue to count on my salary to support my family. But these men had wives and children and these are good jobs. 
all I could tell them was, look, you have to think about this. Talk to your priest about it. Talk to people in your life who are wise and obviously talk to your spouse and then make a decision. I said, I can't in good conscience tell you, no, you must quit your job now. But what I can tell you is that if this isn't the line in the sand, a line in the sand is coming and you had better prepare yourself for that. I think that when you were forced, as a general rule, and as that when one is forced to say something or affirm something that one does not believe in as a condition for one's employment, then one has to say no, even if it costs you your job. And if your family is in such a situation, like with a, an, a sick child, for example, that you would be in really dangerous, uh, a really dangerous situation if you quit your job, then make every possible effort to to find an exit so you can land somewhere soft. The problem is there are fewer and fewer places where you can land somewhere soft. And uh, it's it's really appalling. And I think what's happening is that certain of us on the right uh, are seeing that there is probably going to be a role for the government that we never would have supported before in preventing big business from doing this sort of thing to its employees. I think there is an appropriate role for the government. And believe me, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have said that at all. Um, you know, speaking of soft places to land, right, in in the Soviet Union or in the, the Soviet bloc states, right, um, there, there were certain very, there were some places, some refuges from ideology, not many, but they existed, especially later on um, in, in, for example, engineering or pure mathematics, which is why if you talk to sort of folks who have left the Soviet Union um, or, or the surrounding bloc countries, so many of, of their parents, if you talk to people who were born like me, first generation Americans, so many of their parents are engineers. Uh, that's not mm -hmm, necessarily mm -hmm. by accident. Um, it's, it's because a lot of people, this was one of the refuges that you could seek if you couldn't live with yourself if you weren't willing to actively all the time talk about, you know, what the latest line of the party was, then to some extent you could now in some eras that was impossible as well. But, but in, at least in the softer eras, um, it, it was possible to sort of just do your math. Right. Um, and, and you, you obviously, they didn't tolerate you speaking against the order, but if, if you were a, a um, brilliant engineer, there was a certain amount of, of freedom that it gave you, at least with, within your work, uh, right? Not to mouth the, the platitudes of the regime. Um, are those kinds of refuges, do they exist in our pre-totalitarian moment? It certainly doesn't seem to me that the sciences are our refuge, given what's happening yeah. in in medical schools, um, which which Katie Herzog has done some great reporting on, and, and Aaron Sabarium has as well. Um, given what's happening in the science departments of uh, universities, not just in the humanities, um, not just in in the studies courses, but in hard math, hard science, physics, um, and other departments. It doesn't seem to me that science is going to be that that refuge here. Do, do you have other ideas of perhaps careers that? I, I mean, this this sounds dramatic, but I, I think it, it I think it's actually a very fair way of of thinking about it. If you're a young person today and you're thinking about, you know, what career should I go into? Um, where should I build skills so that I won't be asked to compromise? Um, you know, compromise my soul in a very real way uh, and, and be faced with the, the decision that so many people are faced with today, where it's feed their families and, and in, in the comfort to which they're accustomed or even lower than the comfort to which they're accustomed or uh, knuckle under this kind of ideology. You know, you ask a really important question here, and it's something that a lot of Americans of, um, of the educated social class, even if they're conservatives, are afraid to look at. Uh, somebody was telling me recently, I forget who, that uh, Charlie Kirk, uh, Turning Point USA, asked an audience, you know, he suggested to them that they should send their kids, uh, not send their kids to college, but send them to trade school. And he did not get a lot of positive feedback there because it's really difficult for people of the educated class, you know, whom you and I both are part of that, to think about our kids not going to college. But this is a reality that we have to face. When my, uh, I have three kids, one's in college now, he's studying to work in museums. He's gonna face it head on. But his younger siblings, uh, one is about to turn 18 and he said, dad, I think I might wanna go to trade school. 
And before I would have been like, wait, 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 son, let's let's think about this. But now I'm like, you know what? That might be a good idea. Not only because it's good for his, that's where his talents are, but he's going to be able to have a job that's fairly cancel proof if he learns a trade. My uh, my youngest is in 10th grade and she loves baking and she's gotten to be very good at it. She wants to go to culinary school. Again, I'm thinking this this is great. You will have a job that is and a vocation that is less open to being canceled. So um, this is a sort of uh, uh, conceptual leap that people like you and me and a lot of the people who listen to this program are going to have to make with our children and with ourselves too thinking about building careers that we can do with integrity and without compromising our our beliefs, our principles, or if we're religious, our faith, because this is coming. The thing is though, Inez, this is what concerns me so much about now is the way surveillance works, the um, so-called surveillance capitalism that Shoshana Zuboff from Harvard has written about, the way that all of our, not only the government, but major corporations with our own permission, surveil everything we do through the smartphones and through the laptops. They know where we are. They know who we're in touch with. They know what we read, what we buy and so forth. In China with the social credit system, this is used to uh, oppress people, even if they do nothing wrong at work. If they just happen to be, if this, the system finds out through their GPS coordinates that they were around people with low social credit scores, you know, so-called antisocial people, then the people themselves can get a lower social credit score and it will make it harder for them to work, to travel, to have all these privileges until at the very end, they could be, uh, thrown out of the economy. They're no longer able to buy or sell. And this is without a human being ever laying eyes on them. This is all done by algorithm. I think this is the thing that worries me even more than uh, our kids or we ourselves might be shut out of certain professions uh, because we're not uh, on board with the ruling class ideology. But even uh, our, if, if you work, if you pick up trash, but you happen to read the wrong things or hang out with the wrong people, you may find it hard to get a bank account. This is the sort of thing that is coming and we had better get busy now uh, erecting legal barriers to the woke capitalist who want to do this sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's that's a scary that's a scary thought. And I had thought previously about a social credit system idea, um, but I had connected it directly to the person. The truly scary thing there is that, you know, think it's already such a powerful force that kind of social ostracization that people will drop their friends. Um, without additional incentives, but to think about turbocharging it uh, mm -hmm. so that if you interact with an undesirable, you you direct you immediately suffer the consequences, right? It's you can't even carve out um, that the, the question I wanted to ask you next was how to carve out this kind of zone of privacy, right? That you talk about that was mm -hmm. so important um, living in totalitarian regimes, places where you maybe people's private apartments where you could have lectures, where you could have um, perhaps not explicitly political things, but in fact, um, art, literature, plays, you can sure. have a conversation um, in, in a, a less fearful way. You have to carve out these these both communities and, and zones of privacy where those kinds of conversations can continue to take place. But uh, what you just suggested is, is will make that more difficult. Much more difficult. Uh, I was contacted not long ago by a retired military intelligence uh, officer who uh, read the book and got in touch with me to say, everything you say is absolutely true. He said, I'm a conservative, but I can, I, there's a lot I can't tell you, but I can tell you you're on the right track here. And what he's doing now, he's a, an Eastern Orthodox Christian, as am I, and that's why he contacted me. He said that he's devoting himself in his private time to figuring out ways to help churches be resilient uh, and, and to keep from being persecuted. One of the things he said that all of us are going to have to do is get used to leaving our cell phones at home. He said that you can't even just turn it off, that you know, it's still, you're still trackable and they can still listen to you. I mean, this sounds like crazy James Bond stuff, but it's really happening. When I was in Prague interviewing uh, Camilla Bendova, she and uh, her family, the Benda family of Prague, or I have a whole chapter devoted to them about the things they did as activists, anti-communist activists as a family. Even today, when you go to her house, they don't have smartphones there. 
because they know. Camilla said, if you had had to deal with what we had to deal with, you would not bring anything into your house like a smartphone or an Alexa or anything like that. And uh, look, this is something that I, I know more about this than most people. I still carry my smartphone everywhere, but I think it might end up getting to that point where we have to abandon the use of these things just to protect ourselves. Certainly when we get together for, for, uh, for meetings or conversations. I was out in California not long ago talking to an active duty service member. We just, we met at a social event who was telling me that he would not encourage anybody to go into the military now because he said, it's so woke. It's not the same military it was just two years ago, but he's also in intelligence. And he said, look, there are a lot of things, again, I can't tell you because it would be against the law, but they know that we are standing here right now. If they wanted to know where I was and who I was, and I was talking to you, it's been recorded. And he said, you can trust me on this. It's not conspiracy theory. So this is the kind of thing that that I don't know, Inez, that we have any capacity to deal with. Because even this is where, given the limits of technology in the Soviet era, that uh, even the Soviets couldn't do the sort of things that we can do now. Everything that's being done in China with the social credit system and this techno-totalitarian state, we have the same power to do it technologically here in America we don't have yet the political will to. I think that um, we need to have a freedom movement that's not just a right wing thing, but that gets people who want to protect their liberty on the left to stand against this sort of thing. The problem is that on, on the left itself, I got an email the other day from a friend who's who hates the Republicans with the, the heat of a thousand suns. But he said the trans thing and the way that the that uh, educators, schools are pushing transgender ideology has uh, red pilled him. And now he wants to know how he can work with Republicans to fight this thing in his county, because he said, look, on my side, there is no resistance to it on the, among Democrats because Democrats want to use the power of the state to force people to be good as they define it. So um, this is a, it's a really difficult thing because you have to convince people of what used to be commonly believed in America, which is that you have a right to be wrong. Nowadays, people don't think you have a right to be wrong. Actually, so I, I want to wrap this up with, with a final question because I was reading this and really trying to, to, to think about, and I really do encourage people to read it and, and particularly the second half of it, think about how what small or large steps you can take in your life to prepare for this, the possibility of this kind of future and the ability to live in a way uh, that is is not um, sort of crippling to right. who you are. But but the final question I really wanted to ask you is if, if this comes to pass, which I, I hope it doesn't, and I, I like you, I hope that and I think there's some some reason to hope that there there is a broader backlash happening now. Um, that it, it it's not just the right that there are folks on the center and even Democrats who are waking up to how far this has gone and how mm -hmm. dangerous it can be. Um, so is it, I'm not I just so uh, so I'm clear I'm I'm not fatalistic about where we're going, but I agree with you that this is a real possibility worth considering. And in that light, I wondered what you think that if we manage to carve out for ourselves these, um, you know, sort of zones of privacy, these uh, dissident meetings, um, you you write that, or you talk to folks who say um, that they they gathered in this way to remember who they were or who they are as, as a nation. So you're talking about, for example, Poland, where, um, preserving their their nationhood through uh, multiple occupations over time um you know what what sort what sorts of plays maybe they're not plays but what sorts of um you know what sorts of things would we talk about and show and perform and display uh if we are to preserve who we are as americans in a potential totalitarian future what what would be our sums of that well we have to protect our culture to keep cultural memory uh, alive. I, I see, uh, as you and I are talking, you can see over your shoulder, uh, is that Gary Cooper mm -hmm. at the, in front of us, only uh, Yeah. Yes, uh, well, uh, Gary Cooper in the movie High Noon uh, was a favorite of the Benda family in Prague. They, in the depths of communism, they somehow got their hands mm -hmm. on a copy of High Noon and they showed it to their, the parents showed it to their children and said, this is how one behaves kids when you're faced with 
with um, with an enemy, you know, and so they and they were trying to model for them the importance of passing on cultural memory, these stories. The Benda family, too, they, they read to their kids all the time. I talked to Camilla, the mom, who uh, read for two or three hours a day to their six children, even when her husband was in prison as, as a political prisoner. And what she was trying to do was to build within them an awareness that the things you're hearing in outside of this house are lies. And these stories that you carry in your heart and in your memory will tell you what's true. She looked at me and said, uh, I read him a lot of Tolkien. I said, why Tolkien? She said, because we knew that Mordor was real. And suddenly it, it, it struck me, Inez, that this woman was so wise, Camilla, she knew that her kids would not be able to understand what communism was or any of these theoretical things, but they could understand what Mordor was. They could understand what the Fellowship of the Ring was, and they could analogize the Fellowship of the Ring to the activists in the distance who would come to their mom and dad's house to talk about these things. And so in this way, they kept the cultural memory alive and they used stories to tell people who they were. This is something that we're going to have to do. And I think things like classical Christian schools are one way of doing that. We also need to nurture um, uh, these uh, alternative ecosystems where we really do go back and read the classics, read the things that the woke don't want us to read, watch the movies they don't want us to watch and tell these stories. I should say, too, that the, the book, Inez, is a hopeful book in that it shows that it is possible to resist this if you're prepared to suffer for your principles. Uh, but if you're not prepared to suffer, if co preserving comfort and status is the thing that matters to you most, then you're gonna collapse. All of the dissidents, whether they were Catholic, Protestant, or Eastern Orthodox, they all were solid on that point that we have got to prepare ourselves to suffer for the truth. Um, as Solzhenitsyn did, as Václav Havel did. Final point, I dedicate the book to the memory of this Catholic priest from Croatia named Father Tomislav Kolakovic. Father Kolakovic was a Jesuit in Zagreb doing uh, anti Nazi work in 1943 when he got word that the Gestapo was coming to get him. He sneaked out, went to his mother's homeland, Slovakia, and began teaching at a Catholic university in Bratislava. He told his students the good news is the Germans are going to lose this war. The bad news is the Soviets are going to be ruling this country when it's over. And the first thing they're going to do is come after the church. We have to be ready for them. So he set up, uh, he didn't just talk about this. He acted. He set up these prayer groups of mostly young people who had come together to pray and to study, but also to talk about the things happening in their society around them, what they saw coming and, and decide on action plans, things they could do to get ready for persecution. Within two years of his arrival in that country, these groups had spread out all over the country. Every town of any size had one, and they had a network. The bishops, the Catholic bishops of that country, chastised Father Kolakovic and said, Father, quit scaring people. It will never happen here. But Father Kolakovic had studied communism because he wanted to be a missionary to the Soviet Union. He knew how the communists thought, and he kept doing his work. Sure enough, in 1948, when the Iron Curtain fell over that country, the first thing the communists did was come after the church. The reason there was an underground church for 40 years in that country is because Father Kolakovic saw what was happening in these young people who didn't sit back and just hope that it wouldn't happen. They got busy getting ready for it. And so when the, the priests were arrested, the underground church kicked in. I think we're in a Kolakovich moment here in America, Inez, and I think all of us, whether we're religious or not, whether we're Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Jewish, whatever, we need to start coming together and making plans. I hope it doesn't happen. We have to fight against the coming of totalitarianism as hard as we can. But if we lose this fight, we've got to be able to keep the resistance going. Yeah, uh, you know, I really recommend your book for people who are interested in doing exactly what you just said, because uh, the steps that you outline and and to be you know perfectly clear, uh, you like me, we are lucky. We we never had to to live in this kind of society. But what you've done in this book is go out and talk to people who were able to to both live and resist in those kinds of societies. And not everyone can be or will be Solzhenitsyn. But what you've done for us here is really laid out. Um, you know, 
not quite so concrete as like one, two, three, but but still something more comprehensible ways that we can get ready, perhaps comprehensible, like you said, the child, um, you know, reading, reading Lord of the Rings, what you've done for us here is, is, uh, is laid out Mordor and laid out some things that we can do to prepare ourselves um, for that eventuality if it comes to pass. And as if you, if, as you say, um, if, if we don't win this fight, but Thank you so much, Rod Dreher, for joining us on, on High Noon. Rod Dreher's book is Live Not By Lies, a manual for Christian dissidents. Um, and I really highly recommend everybody read this and, and, and prepare in the way that, that Rod has laid out for us here um, uh, through the words of people who, who really have done it and, and lived through it. Um, it. It is a comfort to know that we are far from the first people to, to be at this kind of juncture um, in, in our lives and in our, our history. And we, we won't be the last uh, if, if the crooked timber of humanity uh, endures. So, uh, Rod, thank you so much for, for joining me on High Noon. It's been a pleasure. And Merry Christmas to you and your listeners. Merry Christmas. And thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Stepman is a product, production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, your comments and questions can go to Inez.Stepman at IWF.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review on Apple, Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or IWF.org. Be brave and we'll see you next time on High Noon. <laughs>